Eh, buonasera, eh, io sono molto contento di avere qui come ospite questa sera David Common, che è l'autore del libro dell'anno, si può dire, eh, Spillover. Eh, in realtà non è un libro nuovo, è un libro che è stato pubblicato nel 2012, ma che è diventato per l'appunto il libro dell'anno proprio perché racconta eh, che cosa vuol dire lo spillover, che cosa vuol dire il salto di specie, che è poi quello che pare ha causato la pandemia che stiamo vivendo in, in questi mesi. Eh, se andate a vedere l'indice dei nomi di, di questo libro, di Spillover, alla voce Pipistrelli trovate una quantità di ricorrenze eh, veramente impressionante e questo ci fa capire quanto David Common avesse capito di quello che avrebbe potuto succedere. Eh, noi terremo questa conversazione in inglese, eh, David Common è a casa sua nel, nel Montana, noi siamo in diretta, eh, tra qualche giorno pubblicheremo anche una versione sottotitolata in italiano, così come abbiamo già fatto per, altre, ehm, per altri incontri eh, che abbiamo eh, trasmesso per la prima volta oggi, quelli, per esempio quelli con Bernardine Evaristo, quel quello con Yves Le alias V, quello con Jonathan Safran Foer. Eh, chi volesse farci delle domande può utilizzare la nostra pagina Facebook. Alla fine della lezione di David Quammen io eh, porterò le vostre domande, alcune delle vostre domande alla sua, alla sua attenzione. So, thank you very much for being uh, with us, uh, David Quammen. Uh, We are live, uh, uh, me from Milan, from Book City Milan, and you are in... Bozeman, Montana, and grazie mille, Oliviero, and buonasera, everyone. I am I was, very, very glad to be part of Book City Milano. Uh, I was uh, uh, telling that you are the author of the book of the year, uh, which uh, was published by Adelphi Spillover, even if it's not your the book of this year, it was published eight years ago, the year we began uh, uh, Book City, and... Uh, um, that we will have uh, the uh, edition of this meeting with Italian subtitles in a few days, uh, as soon as possible, that if someone has questions to ask you, uh, they can write them to us on our Facebook pages, uh, and we will, uh, I will try to put them to your attention. Uh, another thing I wanted to tell uh, everyone is that Uh, you are an extraordinary rewriter. I read in the, um, a few months ago your last book, uh, The Tangle Tree, uh, which is a, an extraordinary reading. Uh, it's about uh, a very arcane subject, the origins of life, but it has an extraordinary story to tell and extraordinary characters. So I leave you uh, to your speech uh, and thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I will be back as soon as you finish. Thank you, grazie mille. Thank you again, Oliviero. And, and thank you all. Uh, as I said, I'm very glad to be part of Book City Milano. And because this is a book festival, I'll start by talking about the book Spillover, um, published uh, in 2012 in the US, 2014 by Adelphi in Italy and uh, a little bit about how it was made. And then I will talk about its connections with our current situation in Italy and the US around the world with COVID-19. Uh, but let me tell you how this book began. About 20 years ago, well, almost exactly 20 years ago, I was asked by National Geographic Magazine, for whom I have done a lot of work, to, uh, to write a series of stories about a very ambitious, expedition uh, across the last remaining great blocks of forest in the Congo Basin in Central Africa. There was an American explorer, conservationist, ecologist named Mike Fay, who planned to walk 2,000 miles on a zigzag route across the last great forests of Central Africa from Northeastern Republic of Congo to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, staying away from villages, staying away from roads and trails, staying in the middle of the forest as much as possible and documenting what was there, recording where the biological diversity was. And so I was asked along with a photographer to go with him on stretches of that walk. 
I walked with him four stretches totaling about 53 days. He was on the trail for 456 days. But I would come in for a week, 10 days, two weeks, and walk with him. We would walk in sandals and river shorts. We would walk through swamp. We would walk across little rivers. We would walk through jungle that had to be cut through with a machete. We would sleep at night in little camps on the ground. And uh, and we would see the gorillas and the chimpanzees and the snakes and the ants and everything that lived in that forest. One of those stretches was through a block of forest that was known to be habitat for the Ebola virus, Minkebi forest, Ebola virus. And I had been a little bit interested in Ebola virus, but when I knew I was going to walk through this block of forest where Ebola virus was, I did some more reading and I learned enough to know that Ebola virus, this very terrifying virus, mysterious African virus, like all viruses, has to live in a reservoir host, in some sort of an animal when it's not infecting humans. Viruses can only replicate when they are in some other creature. They are parasites. They can only replicate inside the cells of a cellular creature. So Ebola occasionally spills over into humans. Where does it live when it's not infecting humans? That is the reservoir host. And that was a mystery still at that point. It's still a mystery. What animal the Ebola virus lives in when it's not infecting humans? So we walked through that forest knowing that Ebola was there somewhere. Maybe it was in a monkey, maybe it was in a bat, maybe it was in a rodent, we didn't know. This focuses the mind. And it focused my mind on the fact that Ebola virus and its story, like the story of all viruses that are new to humans, is a story of ecology and evolutionary biology. Ecology and evolutionary biology. And ecology and evolutionary biology was my journalistic beat, my authorial area of comfort and expertise. So when I realized that the story of scary new viruses, such as Ebola, is a story of ecology and evolutionary biology, I started thinking about a book, started thinking about doing a book on this. Um, these new viruses are a matter of ecology because they live in one kind of animal, and if they get into humans, it's because of an interaction between that animal and humans. Maybe it's humans killing a chimpanzee. Maybe it's humans taking guano from a bat cave that contains the virus, some sort of an interaction. And the virus then has an opportunity to fall, to spill from one kind of host into another kind of host. That sort of interaction, that's ecology. Once a new virus is in humans, Either it survives or it doesn't, either it replicates or it doesn't, either it thrives or it doesn't. And if it does replicate in humans, in this new host, this new habitat, and if it does thrive, it begins to adapt to a new host. And sometimes it finds it can pass from one human to another. Sometimes it passes poorly from one human to another for a period of time, and then it adapts to passing better, transmitting better from one human to another. And it grows into an epidemic or a pandemic. That's evolution. So you have ecology and evolutionary biology. I decided to write a book about the ecology and evolutionary biology of the pathogens, the the agents, the microbes that cause scary new diseases in humans. Some of those are bacteria coming from animals into humans. They can be fungi coming from animals into humans. But the most dangerous and the most dramatic are the viruses that come from non-human animals into humans. The whole category of viruses that are known as zoonotic, zoonotic, um, because they pass from zoological creatures other than humans into humans. 60 to 70% of all human infectious diseases fall in this category. So as I learned more about it, I realized quickly, this is not a small peculiar subject out at the fringe of human medicine. This is central, this is important, but also fascinating. It's fascinating partly because every new virus that gets into humans the current 
coronavirus got into humans sometime around this time last year. Every new virus that appears in humans has to come from somewhere. Where does it come from? It comes from its reservoir host. What's the reservoir host? That is a mystery at the beginning. So whenever a new virus appears in humans, Ebola virus in 1976, um, Hendra virus in Australia in 1994, Nipah virus in Malaysia in 1998, new viruses suddenly appearing in humans causing illness and death, that becomes a mystery, a detective story. Disease detectives swarm to the spot. Well, they don't swarm because there aren't that many of them, but a few brave, brilliant disease detectives go out and try and solve this mystery. There's a new virus in humans. Where did it come from? What's the reservoir host? What animal has it been living in for millions of years from which it has suddenly, accidentally gotten into humans? They want to identify that animal, the reservoir host. They want to find out how the virus passed from that animal into humans. And then they want to see how the virus has been adapted to humans so that it can cause not just disease in one human, the way rabies causes disease in one human, but a, a, an outbreak, an epidemic, a pandemic, a raging connection of, of cases moving from one human to another. So this whole subject, it's about detective stories. It's very serious. It involves severe um, uh, misery and death among humans, but it also is about detective stories. So when I wrote Spillover, I wrote about these detectives, these people, men and women, who go out into the forest or wherever, go into the caves in southern China, um, go into the forests of Central Africa, wherever they go, um, to solve these mysteries of new diseases, figure out what animal the disease has come from, how it got into humans. That tells us how to avoid future spillovers of the same virus and how it is evolving. That helps us understand how to deal with it, how to create vaccines, how to create thera therapeutics. It's all detective stories. Science is a great detective story. So, so I created the book Spillover um, and it's a, it is a tapestry of these stories of specific diseases um, and the people who have solved the mysteries or continue to try to solve the mysteries of those diseases. Okay, so this is a pattern. The book was published originally in 2012. I want to connect it now to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, first of all, one of the points that I make in the book is that these spillovers of new virus into humans that sometimes lead to an outbreak of 20 or 30 or 100 cases, and then if we're unlucky, they might lead to an epidemic. Um, these are not individual events that are simply happening to us humans. These things are part of a pattern, and that pattern reflects things that we humans are doing. The pattern in recent history goes back at least to 1960. I could list a whole sequence of, of new viruses that have spilled over from wild animals into humans. Machupo, Bolivia, 1961. Marburg virus coming out of Uganda to Germany in research monkeys in 1967. Ebola, 1976. HIV, the causing the AIDS pandemic, recognized in 1981, although it had been in humans much longer than that. And so it goes, so it goes. You know, um, uh, Hendra virus in Australia, 1994, coming out of bats, passing through racehorses and getting into humans. Nipah virus in 1998, also coming out of bats, passing through pigs on pig farms, getting into humans and killing humans. SARS, the original SARS-1, 2003, also bats coming out of bats in Southern China, getting into humans and so on, so on. There are more that I could list. These are all part of a pattern. The the pattern is, a, is a, a sequence of interconnected events sharing a common cause. And the cause is human interaction with the wild animals that carry viruses. All wild animals carry their own unique viruses. So when humans come in contact with wild animals, 
we offer the viruses that live in these animals, some of which are endangered, we offer them an opportunity to spill into a new host that is extremely abundant, not endangered. Eight billion of us on the planet, we humans. So if a virus has the opportunity to spill into humans and it happens to do that and it can adapt to us and it can make us sick and it can transmit, that virus has won the sweepstakes. That virus has seized a great opportunity to become abundant and widespread around the world. It's, it's chance uh, and natural selection, Darwinian natural selection, that creates this phenomenon. Um, but it's we humans causing disruption in diverse ecosystems where wild animals live that bring this about. So it's human population multiplied by human consumption that disrupts wild ecosystems, bringing the resources to us. We're hungry for animal protein. We're hungry for meat. We're hungry for forest products, for timber. We're hungry for minerals that can be mined in forests, fossil fuels. We're hungry for all these resources. And as we draw these resources toward us, we draw viruses toward us as well, the viruses that those wild animals carry. And so it becomes inevitable that there will be outbreaks of new viruses appearing in humans that can endanger us. If we are smart and we can control those outbreaks before they become epidemics, before they become pandemics, then we will save ourselves a lot of misery and death. In this case, COVID-19, we failed. We failed to control the outbreak at the beginning. Why did we fail? Not because the science wasn't there, not because scientists hadn't been warning about this. They had been for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. I had been listening to those warnings when I researched spillover uh, 10 years ago and 12 years ago. And I put those warnings, I, I compiled sort of a summary version of what those scientists were saying and put it into the book Spillover. And what we were saying at that point was, yes, there is a great pandemic coming. It will be caused by a, a new virus, new to humans. That virus will come out of a wild animal. What kind of a wild animal? Hmm, possibly a primate because we're most closely related to primates and therefore their viruses might be adapted to us or possibly a bat because bats have a long history of carrying viruses that can do damage in humans. So a virus coming out of an animal, possibly a bat. What kind of virus? Possibly an influenza virus or a coronavirus. We said this eight years ago. I said this in the book. I only said it because the scientists were saying it to me, and I, I, I listened to scientists that I trusted. Uh, where would this happen, this coronavirus coming out of a bat and getting into humans. Well, somewhere where humans have contact with wild animals. For instance, an area where animals, wild animals are harvested for food. Oh, for instance, in China. It was all there. So then what happened? Well, it got into humans. It discovered that it could transmit quite well, probably from the beginning, from human to human. Why is that? That's a scientific question that is still being researched. Um, it came out of, uh, ultimately out of a bat. We know that. It may have passed through another form of animal, possibly a pangolin, a little so-called scaly anteater, a beautiful, gentle creature that, um, that lives in the wild in China and uh, other parts of Asia and, and Africa, eight different species, but the ones in China are harvested for food. So it might have spent time in a pangolin or not. Um, we don't know exactly which wild animal population it came from. We have um, scientists have found a virus in bats that matches it 96%, 96% identical to this virus. But 96% identical could still involve 20 to 50 years of evolutionary change. So the closest virus that we have found, that scientists have found in bats in China, um, is probably 50 degrees of evolutionary difference 
from this virus, meaning that there might be another bat population that was separated from the bat population we know for 50 years, and this virus evolved independently in that population, which we haven't yet found, and then got into humans. And then there were warnings, and the warnings went unheeded. Uh, China was hit hard, as we all know, in the city of Wuhan at the beginning. Then China got control of the outbreak. Um, how did they get control? How have they controlled it now? Well, they've done so with very, very rigorous public health measures and with an authoritarian government, a very strong government that imposed constraints on the people of Wuhan that it would be difficult, if not impossible, to impose on the people of Milan or New York, democratic countries. Uh, in, the U in the U.S., uh, we had the science, we had the public health, we had the warnings, but we had bad leadership. We had terrible national leadership um, in denial. And I don't want to get very political, but you all know what and whom I'm talking about. Um, Italy was hit very hard, as you know better than I do, at the beginning, in March and April, in Lombardy, in Milan, in Bergamo. Um, terrible suffering and death. Why? I think Italy was unlucky. I think it's because there were a few super spreaders that had come in long before anybody knew that there could be such a thing as super spreaders of the virus who were showing no symptoms. I think that may be what happened in Lombardy. And now, um, and now we're on the roller coaster. Now we're on the roller coaster. Now it's so hard to control because there are so many cases, it's difficult to trace contacts. Um, what we need, in addition to the science and the public health, um, the vaccine development and the therapeutics development, are political will and community will. By political will, I mean the leadership um, that has the courage to pay attention to the scientist and to pose, impose the constraints that are necessary on free peoples. And by community will, what I mean is the willingness the willingness of free peoples in democracies like Italy, like the United States, like the United Kingdom, the willing in France, the willingness of those people as individuals and as community members to constrain themselves, to wear masks, to socially distance, to deal with the difficulties of closed economies or constrained economies, the, the suffering. And I know there is suffering. If, for people who run businesses that depend on, on freedom of movement and gathering, the people who run theaters, the people who run restaurants and bars, um, the schools. I know there is great difficulty in being constrained, in being closed down. We need to get through that difficulty with help from our governments, with, with aid from governments to support those businesses that are most hard hit with support for the people who are doing the dangerous work, the necessary work, not just the medical people, but certainly the medical people, first of all, but all the other people, the people who work in grocery stores, uh, the people who keep the metro going, the people who drive buses, the people who teach our children in our schools, all of those people, we need to support them. We need to, we need to defeat this virus through community will, as well as political will, science, and public health. Um, and I really believe we can, because we are humans. And besides being hungry for resources, we are also smart and adaptable. And, and we can do this. It won't be easy. Uh, and it's terrible in Italy right now. It's terrible in the U.S. right now. But we can do it. So I will stop there thanking you um, for again, for inviting me, for your attention. And I would love to, um, to answer some questions now. Thank you so much. It was really interesting and mind-opening in, in some ways. Um, I have uh, a question about the Tangled Tree. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, uh, it's about the origins of life, but we learn a thing that is important for us today, that inside uh, humans, uh, there are genes of lots of other species, so that the difference between one species and another is not so big as we thought a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, how did you happen to discover this? Yes. 
Uh, well, Oliviero, um, the answer to that um, will allow me to put this in context for our, for our audience a little bit. Um, Spillover, as I mentioned, was published in 2012. In 2013, I started looking for my next book project. It became The Tangled Tree, uh, L'Albero Intercato, published in 2018, 2000, uh, this year, 2020, by Adelphi in Italy. Um, but so 2013, I was looking around, and I happened to read something about a phenomenon called horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer. I read some scientific articles, some other articles, and what horizontal gene transfer is, is the movement of genes sideways across species boundaries, across even boundaries between kingdoms of life. Most of heredity, most of the passage of genes is, is we think of it as vertical, from parents to offspring, passing down from grandparents to parents to children. Genes are passed down, that's vertical. And the history of that sort of evolution, that sort of heredity is represented by the tree of life as Charles Darwin proposed it, an evolutionary tree of life. Instead of going down, the genes are flowing up from a trunk, a single source of life, a couple of great limbs that branch, that diverge from the trunk and then branches that, that spread out from the limbs. So the tree of life, the, the evolutionary tree of life was the image of that kind of evolution. Lineages were always diverging and genes were always being passed along on those linear limbs and branches. But in the late 20th century, thanks to genome sequencing technology, scientists started recognizing this phenomenon of horizontal gene transfer, that genes sometimes move sideways and not just vertically up and down, but sideways across species boundaries and even from one limb of life into another, that limbs of life sometimes flow into one another. You might have two limbs and then a small branch that that flows from one limb into the other. That is horizontal gene transfer. And, and scientists discovered that by sequencing genomes and comparing them. And they found that there were some genes, for instance, in, um, in a particular kind of insect that shouldn't have been in that insect because those genes were not in any of the relatives of that insect, but the closest genes that could be found to that gene in an insect were in a lizard. What? Yes, this is one of the extreme versions of horizontal gene transfer. How could that be possible? Well, one of the ways it's possible is by what's called infective heredity. Viruses can carry genes sideways from one form of life into another, picking up genes in one host creature that the virus is infecting, and then passing those genes to another creature, even to another kind of creature if the virus is able to infect it. So that became the subject of, of um, my new book, the, the, and I called it the tangled tree because of that entanglement. Instead of all diverging, there was limbs converging and moving around sideways. I have some questions from the people who were listening to your to your speech. Um, uh, the first one is a personal one, and I like it uh, a lot. It is the last one, in, in fact. Were you ever afraid for your life when you did the research for your book? Uh, I, no, I, I wasn't. Um, I went to some uh, some very wild places with some scientists to look for some very dangerous viruses, but I trust these scientists. Um, so, if we were looking for Ebola, if we were looking for looking for Ebola, for instance, in bats in Ivory Coast, um, I went with a scientist who was hoping to find Ebola virus in a certain species of bat. So he was capturing bats and taking blood samples with his team. Um, or in Bangladesh. Uh, I was on a rooftop of a warehouse with a scientist. He was catching giant fruit bats, um, taking blood samples to look for a Nipah virus, another very dangerous virus. At one point, I was climbing through caves in southern China with another scientist who was catching little bats with a butterfly net, hoping to find SARS. My, um, my approach was always to take whatever precautions these scientists took 
in terms of personal protective equipment, and then stand three feet behind them with my hands behind my back so that they would not hand me a bat. Um, <laughs> so the danger were the, were the scientists, not the bats. Yes, uh, yes. Sophia is asking a, a, a very tough uh, question. Uh, you told about the story of scientists studying this kind of new viruses coming in and then politicians... Uh, uh, having to take care of the problem. And then in the last uh, stand, the community citizens that, that must answer the crisis. Where did the delay came uh, for the spreading of coronavirus in, in China? Uh, did the scientists, were the scientists late uh, to say uh, where the danger was or what happened? I think there was a delay in China that was costly. Yes, I think there was. Um, I think there was a point, I think the crucial point probably occurred during December. Um, there were cases of what was being called abnormal pneumonia. Um, they identified a virus. It was a coronavirus. Um, and they identified that, um, that this virus was capable of human-to-human -human transmission. And that was a crucial piece of information. It seems to have been not announced promptly, the fact of human-to-human -human transmission. And that may have been because of political decisions at the level of uh, Wuhan city government or political decisions at the level of um, Hubei province government. Uh, and meanwhile, there were, there were heroic people like uh, Wenliang Li, the young optometrist who was telling his friends on social media, look, here in Wuhan, we have a dangerous virus that's passing from human to human. And then quickly in January, um, word was passed that the, the genome was sequenced and it was announced to the world on January 10th. And so after that delay, China then made up for it and, um, and has been, I think, very, very open since then. Um, and uh, so, So there was, I think, a problem with China's behavior early on, and then there was a problem with Western behavior after that. And all of that contributed to the situation that we have. I think there's enough, there's enough responsibility um, to go around to a lot of different people. Uh, Cecilia asks uh, if the scientists you were working with were mainly Americans or that if they were from all over the world. Um, they were probably... Uh, more Americans than any other nationality, but there were also uh, British scientists that I was working with and uh, um, Congolese scientists that I was working with and Chinese scientists um, and um, Bangladeshi scientists. So, and, and whenever I went to a country with, with one of these scientists, a man or woman, um, they would always have partners, national partners. So if we went to Bangladesh, so if I went to Bangladesh with an American scientist, that American scientist would have Bangladeshi partners who would be working very closely with him. They would be connected with the university in Bangladesh, with the laboratory in Bangladesh. It's a very, very international uh, community of scientists, and that is very important. That interconnectivity of of scientists in um, in countries all over the world. Another question, another tough question. Um, uh, there's a person asking, what would you answer to uh, people who deny uh, that the virus is so dangerous and that think it's a conspiracy uh, made by I don't know who to... Um, yeah. What would you answer to those kinds? Well, of there are people, there are always people who want to deny, deny evidence, deny science. They have a story that they, for whatever reasons, personal reasons or political reasons, a story that they prefer to believe. In many cases, when it comes to conspiracy theories, I, I think that it's because um, conspiracy theories are more dramatic than real life. And people who believe in conspiracy theories apparently need more excitement in their lives. And so they embrace conspiracy theories because there's a thrill in thinking that there's a conspiracy behind these events. At the opposite end of that um, are people who, for political reasons or economic reasons, uh, uh, want to want to deny that the, the, there is any drama at all. 
oh, this is just another flu. This is going to go away. And some of those people are the same people. So at the same time, they're saying, oh, this is a this is a flu. It's going to go away. They also want to say, oh, but this is this is a virus that was created by the CIA to to hurt China or it was created by a laboratory in China to hurt the rest of the world. Um, if you want to hurt an enemy, a virus is a very, very clumsy way to do it. Um, you know, it's like uh, it's it's like um, you're arguing with someone across a table. So you're going to set off a hand grenade. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. And the scientists who study uh, the genome of this virus, a number of very uh, trusted scientists around the world have looked at the genome and they have said this was not a virus that was engineered in a laboratory. You could not and you would not create a virus like this um, from a laboratory. And we know that nature has created viruses very much like this. There are hundreds of coronaviruses living in wild animals just in China, probably hundreds living just in bats in China. Bats are good animals. We don't want to blame this on bats, but they do carry a lot of coronavirus. So there are lots of viruses that also could infect humans that are in nature. They have, they have been engineered by, by Darwinian natural selection. You don't need conspiracies to explain that. And there's no evidence whatsoever that this was a, a wild virus that escaped from a laboratory. That's another conspiracy theory or, or dramatic theory that some people want to embrace. This virus escaped from a laboratory in the city of Wuhan. Zero evidence, zero evidence. And those laboratory people there, and I've talked with one of them, um, they say, no, we were not, we were not even growing this virus in our laboratory. We were, we had samples from which we had assembled the genome of this virus so that we could sequence it. But that's very different from growing live virus in the laboratory. And we were not doing that. Uh, another another question, uh, uh, Karel asks, uh, do you think uh, that the attitude of uh, politicians towards uh, scientific research will change after this? Because before, uh, no one was really interested in, in this subject. Now, what will happen after this pandemic? I hope, I hope that the attitude of political leaders will change. Um, Part, I think, of what happened in terms of political failure was that um, the scientists and the public health people were saying, we need to prepare for a pandemic. Well, what does it cost? Well, it costs billions of dollars to prepare for a pandemic. Maybe it costs 10 billion to get your country ready, and maybe it costs 100 billion to get the world ready with a network. Well, that sounds like a lot of money. Politicians say, I'm not going to spend that money because at the next election, three years from now, people were going to say, you spent $10 billion and there's no pandemic. So they don't spend the money. But how much is $10 billion or even $100 billion compared to the cost of COVID-19? Small. So it's false economy. We have learned. Even politicians perhaps have learned. Um, probably not... Um, the, oh, I don't want to be too political. Probably not the, the ignorant individual who is president of my country at this particular time, and for not for very much longer. He probably has not learned, um, but I hope political leaders in Italy have learned and political leaders in the United Kingdom have learned and the political leaders that are coming into my country, I'm sure have learned that uh, preparedness is expensive, but it's much, much, much less expensive than pandemic. Not just in terms of lives, but also in terms of money, in terms of the economy. Um, you talked uh, about the origins of this kind of disease uh, during your speech, and you were speaking about our relationship with uh, nature, with wildlife. So, uh, uh, I think this is a part of the problem and also part of the solution. It's not just uh, scientists, vaccines, uh, therapies, and so on. I think that we must have a different attitude, attitude towards our planet, because otherwise uh, other pandemics will come out very quickly. Absolutely correct. I agree with you. 
Absolutely. And that's one of the most important things that can be said about this whole experience. We need a different attitude toward we are part of the world of nature. We need a different attitude toward the rest of the world of nature. We need our concern for the three big problems to govern the rate at which we multiply ourselves is the human population and the rate at which we consume the three big problems, the threat of pandemic climate change and loss of biological diversity of value in its own sake. Those are the three biggest problems that we face as far as I'm concerned on this planet. They all, they are, they are separate, but they are interconnected. Pandemic threat, climate change, loss of biological diversity. And they all have the same ultimate cause, which is human consumption of the rest of the natural world, human disruption and consumption of the rest of the natural world. That's what's causing all of those three. We have to we have to, um, as citizens of countries and as individuals, we have to recalibrate our, the choices that we make, all the choices that we make, what we eat, um, how much we travel, how many children we have, if we have children, what we consume in all ways, even owning, even, even owning a computer or a cell phone makes us customers for a mineral called coltan that's necessary in these things, coltan, where is that mined? Just in a few places around the world, including the Eastern Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the miners are essentially obliged to, to eat wild animals to sustain themselves. And by doing that, we may not be eating bats, we may not be eating monkeys, but by purchasing a cell phone, we ask other people, men and women, to go to those mines and live on monkeys and rodents and porcupines and bats to get that coltan for us. So we have to think about all these things and recalibrate our personal choices as well as our choices uh, of leadership. Uh, I got uh, some other questions. Do you have some more time for us? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, uh, Claudia asks, why was the first SARS uh, pandemic contained better than this one? What That's happened? A Good question. That's a good question, which we haven't touched on. Um, the first SARS outbreak, you could call it a pandemic because it spread to cities around the world, but not very many cases. 2002, a new virus appeared in southern China. It spread to Hong Kong. It spread to the airport. From the airport in Hong Kong, it spread to Toronto, to Beijing, to Singapore, to um, Vietnam, to Bangkok. It was terrifying to the disease scientists that I know. I've talked to some of them about it. Uh, there's one fellow who works who worked then at the American CDC. And I asked him, what was the scariest um, virus you've ever seen? And he says SARS, meaning SARS-1. This was a number of years ago. Why? Because it could have been a global pandemic. We, we were lucky and we were smart and we contained it quickly. It did not burn out. It had the potential to be a pandemic, killing millions of people. In fact, it only killed 774 people, infected about 8,000. So it killed one person in 10 that it infected. Um, it was different from this virus in several ways. One, it did not seem to have asymptomatic spread it did not seem to be spread from people who were walking around feeling healthy the way this virus is. It had a higher case fatality rate than this virus. So people took it very seriously from the beginning. Uh, and we were lucky. When it spread from, from Hong Kong, it went to countries with strong national governments and strong health care systems. Toronto, Beijing, Singapore, places that could clamp down on a new virus, and they did. Um, and uh, they contained it, controlled it, uh, when it had only infected 8,000 people. But then the warning wasn't heeded. There was, there was work on a SARS vaccine, and after SARS went away, um, the funding went away for the vaccine. If we had had that vaccine, that vaccine would have given us a head start toward a vaccine for this SARS, for SARS-2.
Uh, there's a question linked to, to the answer you gave by Sergei. He asks, uh, uh, what is the role of public health service in stopping a pandemic? Public health services in each country are hugely important. Public health services are the people who take the scientific information and turn it into organization in communities. Um, so it's vastly important. Um, many of the scientists that I went into the forests with uh, had also studied public health. Um, I talked with one of them this morning. He has a veterinary degree, a PhD in ecology, and a master's in public health. So these, this new kind of scientists, these disease scientists for the 21st century, they understand that to deal with these pandemic threats, you need to understand veterinary medicine, how viruses work in wild animals, ecology, how interactions work between humans and other creatures, and public health, how you take the, that scientific information and turn it into organized responses among communities and between nations. Uh, one last question. Uh, it's a young student called Elisa, and mm -hmm. uh, she said that at the end of the, your book, you say that a uh, big one, the big pandemic will come. Do you think this COVID-19 pandemic is the big one, or what do we have to wait from the future? Right, right. Um, the, the, the phrase I use is the next big one, the next big one. And so 10 years ago, when I was talking to these scientists, I asked them that question, will there be a next big one, meaning a pandemic? And they said, yes, they told me those things I told you earlier. Yes, there is a pandemic coming. It might be caused by a coronavirus. It might come out of a bat. So this is the next big one that they were talking about and I was talking about then. But this is not the last big one or it's not necessarily the last big one. There can still be, from our perspective now, another next big one. It could be an influenza. It could be another coronavirus. There will be a threat. There will be a spillover. There will be an outbreak of a new virus, maybe next year, maybe three years from now, maybe five years from now. Another threat will come. And if we're not better prepared than we were this time, that will be the next big one and we will have another pandemic. But if we are prepared, then there will be threats, there will be knocks at the door, there will be spillovers, there will be outbreaks, but maybe the outbreaks can be contained the way SARS-1 was contained in 2003. Thank you so much, uh, David, uh, David Common. It was a real pleasure to have you here and uh, your generosity and uh, uh, the clarity of your expose was uh, really, really outstanding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Olivier. Yeah. Great pleasure to be there and uh, to be with you. And, and, and thanks to all the people in Italy who are, um, who are tuning in. And, um, and good luck to you. Be sane, be strong. Um, get through this. We will get through this. I'm thinking of you. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon in Milano. Thank you. I hope so too. Ciao. Ciao.